Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to worship here at Peace. Good to see you all on this Sunday morning. It is good to worship together. And it is even better to know that Christ is here among us this morning. We are more than halfway through Lent. For all of you who are fasting or giving up things, hey, um, it's not that long anymore. We are, we, we, we are over half time. <laughs> Easter starts to shine um, way at the horizon now. And even in our, um, well, our readings today, we really focus on the cross. Um, those readings um, also shine the light of Easter through the cross into our hearts. If this is your first time here, um, we invite you to uh, fill out one of those visitor cards in front of you, if you'd like to know, if you'd like us to know who you are and maybe want to get in touch. And now we're going to hear some announcements. It's good to be able to laugh at church, it's good to be able to also focus on Christ coming to us and to our hearts and to give thanks for God's mercy and forgiveness. So let's prepare ourselves as we get ready to confess our sins. We are gathered here in the name of God the Father, who is merciful towards all of creation, the Son, who is God's love in the flesh, and the Holy Spirit, who assures us of God's grace. <clears throat> Gracious and loving God, we give thanks to you for the light of your mercy that is shining brightly in our lives. Even before we could ask for forgiveness, you had already forgiven us. You have put our sin as far away as the morning is from the evening. We don't have to be afraid. Give us the courage to name our sin and to boldly claim your forgiveness <coughs> through Jesus Christ, your Son. Amen. Let us now confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another, and let's begin with a brief moment of personal reflection. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us. Renew us and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us, even when we were dead in sin, and made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit, that Christ may live in your hearts through faith.
Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray. And here we are, O oh God. We come because your mercy draws us near. We come because the news of your grace is just unresistible. We come because we want to be close to your love and know your love inside and out. God, we come with all that's on our hearts, with the healing that we need, the forgiveness that we need. We come with our longing for you in our lives, to fill us with good things, to fill us with the things that cannot ever go away or are just temporary. So come. Come to us as we draw near to you. Fill our hearts with your Holy Spirit. Fill our minds with your word. As we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. The reading, Numbers chapter 21. From Mount Hor, the Israelites set out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. But the people became impatient on the way. The people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent poisonous serpents among the people, and they bit the people, so that many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We have sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord to take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a poisonous serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten shall look at it and live. So Moses made a serpent of bronze and put it upon a pole, and whenever a serpent bit someone, that person would look at the serpent of bronze and live. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Gospel according to John in the third chapter. Glory to you, o Lord. Jesus said, Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light, as the light has come into the world, and people loved darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light and do not come to the light, so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise you, O Christ. You know what we learn from that story of that moth, serpent, or the serpents in the wilderness? There's always a reason to complain. 
always. Uh, and even if, right, I mean, the, what, what the Israelites do is they complain, saying, there is no food, and it tastes terrible. <laughs> But beside that, it, it is a really a difficult story, that story of the raw serpent. Um, and, and that for diff different reasons. Um, one of the reasons certainly is that, um, and that, that's often the Old Testament story, is here we meet a God who gets angry at the people and then punishes them by sending poisonous snakes among them. I don't know, but for me it's always a bit unsettling. Um, to read about God, a God who is very emotional and reacts with, with emotions. Because somehow we have this idea of a very stoic and unmoved God who always goes according to the plan God made long before. There, there, there's a reason why many of these older Jesus movies Jesus seems to always be very removed from the world. He's not agitated, he's not whatever, right? He's very, always somewhat stoic, calm. Um, but not, not calm in a good way, in a very unrelated or relatable way to the people. But a God who shows anger, love, frustration. Remember the Noah story? Where God is frustrated about even creating humankind because it just didn't work out. Regret in the same story. Impatience. A God like this is less predictable, right? Uh, it, it's nice if we, if we can predict God, but who knows what such a God could do? This actually is a God who might use, as weird as it is, a gross serpent on a pole to bring healing to the people. This God might send his son to reconcile people once and forever so that no one ever is condemned by God. What might this God all do to come through to us, the people God loves? You see the story of the, with the poisonous snakes I don't read this as a story of an angry God who is out to punish disobedient people. Although we all would totally understand, right? Like if you ever read um, the story of the Israelites leaving Egypt, they're complaining, like every chapter, right? Every chapter they complain. Not, not that we ever complain, <laughs> right? But it's not. While we think, yes, God could be so angry at these people, we would be angry if our children would be complaining, no, like they do, right? Five hour drive somewhere, are we there yet? Are we there yet? How far, how much further is it? It's a story of a God who's actually compassionate and who listens to the voice of the people, their repentance, and delivers the people of the consequences of their own wrongdoing. In Deuteronomy, there is um, um, also a talk about this wilderness that was full of poisonous snakes. But whoever wrote Deuteronomy saw it as God delivering the people, not punishing them. <coughs> the point of the story is not punishment. <coughs> point is that God provided the way for healing. Now, not by taking away the snakes, right? You kind of think, okay, God sent the snakes, so why would he not just take them away? Not by taking away the consequences of their wrongdoing, <coughs> but providing a way of healing. <coughs> but why a poor serpent? That, that, that's a like, really weird thing. I mean, the boss serpent was a, um, an, an image of the goddess of fertility mm. in all the surrounding nations. Every, every culture around them had a temple with a boss serpent in, them, in it. 
Why would God want to use a bronze serpent after he clearly, God clearly said in the Ten Commandments that people are not supposed to make great images? But what is the symbol? What does the bronze serpent symbolize? It symbolizes the consequence of the wrongdoing of the Israelites. They're looking at the consequence of what they have been doing wrong. The consequence was snakes. The consequence of what others might be doing might be something else, right? But that was the consequence of their sin. And God puts this image of their sin before their eyes. And it's basically, they're looking at something that brings death. That's what those poisonous snakes did. And this is the point where Jesus takes the story of the bronze serpent and it becomes a metaphor for Jesus' death at the cross. Because in a very similar way, when we look at the cross, the real cross, when we look at the cross, we see the consequence of our sin. We see the, see the consequence of our ignoring of God. We see the consequence of not trusting in God, but rather trusting our own devices and this consequence. We see in the suffering, and the death of Jesus Christ. It's not about the afterlife. Like, we, 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 like when we talk about death and hell, we kind of always think, ah, oh, that's right, the punishment, or not punishment if you go to heaven after this life. No. It, it's all about death and hell and life in this life. Here today, in our world today, because we see and hear about the consequences of our bad choices every day. Drones attacking civilians in Ukraine. That's a consequence of our, our human sinfulness. Terrorist massacre in Israel. Civilians starving in Gaza right now. Gun violence in this country, scapegoating of immigrants, and, and our own reactions with fear and, and hopelessness and frustration when things don't go the way we like them to come. <clears throat> Heaven or hell are not a future concept, but they are real today. For those of you who are um, attending um, the Adult Forum right now um, and uh, reading that book, The Four Agreements, the author says that we are creating our own hell and that we are our own worst judges. And he is right. He is absolutely right. Because it's not God judging us. We are great in judging ourselves. And others for that matter, right? Even better in judging others. It's not God condemning, condemning us. We are capable of doing this all on our own. We don't even need God to condemn us or judge us. And I still think that often enough we're just projecting our own judgment, our own self-condemnation on God. It's not God, it's us. Because God's sole purpose that he clearly stated throughout the entire Bible is our salvation. God's sole purpose is our healing. <coughs> God's sole intention is to give us life. God's sole objective is to redeem us and to help us to trust in God and in God's good ways. And while we all wish that God would just make this world a better place and take all the snakes and the consequences of our wrongdoing away, just like that, and paradise, heaven on earth, God goes a different way. God's cure is the cross. God gives us the cure, the image, the symbol of what the consequences of our sins are. 
And I, I'd like to go away from this idea. It's like, um, it's the consequence and Jesus had to pay for our sins. But if you just look at the, at the cross and see all the crosses in the world today, and since Jesus, the suffering of people at the hands of others, that's the consequence of our sin. And Jesus' suffering, going through the torture, the mocking, uh, the laughing, um, the distrust and making fun of him, it's just what so many go through in this world. And God just goes there with all this, all this suffering in the world and dies on the, because of it. And the cross, and the crucified Jesus, we see the consequence of our separation from God. And yet, God says, believe in this image, believe in Jesus, believe in Christ, and you are redeemed. At the cross, our relationship to God has been restored. In the story of the snakes, it's the serpent of the pole that gives life. But for us, it's the cross of Christ that bears the message that there is no condemnation for us, no judgment. Because Christ has taken it to the cross, has overcome death and sin, and has overcome the separation of God and humankind. We are set free. We are acquitted from all charges against us. We don't have to judge ourselves anymore. We are free to trust God's ways and to trust God's love and God's provisions. So when you are afraid and hopeless, look to the cross, because there is hope. When the darkness threatens to overcome you, look to the cross, there the darkness is overcome. When you are filled with fear and death threatens you, look to the cross. Christ has overcome. Christ is alive. Look to the cross of Christ who died and was raised to life and gives us hope <clears throat> and life. At the cross we find healing. At the cross there is healing for our entire world.
<coughs> Trusting in God's promise to reconcile all things, let us pray for the church, the well-being of creation, and a world in need. <clears throat> Gracious God, your love unites. Give vision to the global church and foster cooperation and mission. Increase interreligious understanding and economical dialogue. Make your church a sanctuary for all fleeing persecution, disaster, and war, especially those in Ukraine and Gaza. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Creating God, your love enlivens. Restore balance to the Earth's fragile habitats. Preserve wilderness, lands, rainforests, and wildlife. Cleanse oceans and rivers. Make us good stewards of the earth. Hear us, O oh God. Your, your mercy is great. Righteous God, your love liberates. We give thanks for those who courageously witness to your liberating love. Especially Harriet Tubman and Sojourner Truth, renewers of society, whom we commemorate today. Free all people from the evils of racism, religious strife, and hatred. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Merciful God, your love heals. Care tenderly for all those loved ones perished from pandemic disease in every nation. Strengthen health care workers, first responders, and caregivers. Relieve all who live with chronic illness and pain. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Incarnate God, your love enlightens. Open our hearts and minds to fresh understandings of our faith. Deepen our love for you and for one another. Teach us to pray for our enemies. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Let us remember in prayer Kim, Steve, Esther, Caroline, Arlene, Alan, Jeff, and Jamie. Your mercy, hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Abiding God, your love saves. Those who died in the faith are made alive in Christ. We give thanks for your promise that we also will be raised to newness of life. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Accompany us on our journey, God of grace, and receive the prayers of our hearts through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. We will be receiving the offering after the bells.
maker of all things. Through your goodness, you have blessed us with these gifts, ourselves, our time, and our possessions. Use us and what we have gathered in feeding the world with your love through the one who gave himself for us, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ who humbled himself and shared our life to live among us, to reveal to us your great love. In his cross we see your love and grace. In his resurrection we see your glorious victory over death. And this is why with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn.
May the body and the blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in God's grace. Amen. Generous God, at this table we have tasted you immeasurable grace. As grains of wheat are gathered into one bread, now make us one loaf to feed the world. In the name of Jesus, the bread of life. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen.